Let me pray and then ask uh, for God's uh, guidance today as we do the study. Gracious, loving Father, we just thank you that we can once again come together and uh, open the Bible and hear your word to us as your disciples in this day and age as, Father, we try to live uh, honoring your name and being a witness for you. We continue to uh, grow in your knowledge, the understanding you grant us. And so help us, Lord, as we uh, turn to another subject today and pray that you will guide us and uh, continue to open our minds and hearts to understand, to be willing to learn, to be willing to question and uh, continue to be enriched by the word that you have preserved for us. So we commit the study into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome uh, to all of you again for joining the study. Um, I have uh, been away for a while, and so this is uh, a study that I'm doing after a, a, quite a bit of time. I'm picking up where I've le uh, left off with regards to uh, the subject, the series of subjects I've been dealing with, and that is the history of the church. Uh, which I have titled Story of the Church. Uh, what I want to do is, as we proceed, I am coming close to more or less the end, but from time to time, I might pick up on some aspects of history and come back with uh, some more understanding on the history of the church. But today, I'm turning my attention to a subject which uh, is probably fairly close to all of us. Uh, we have uh, sort of and, uh, seen this in action in our fellowship uh, if from close quarters, uh, and that is the keeping of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment among the ten. Uh, the, you know, and what I want to do today is go through the history of uh, Sabbatarianism, but let me just bring up the share my screen with you uh, regarding this. If you just give me a moment, I'll bring it up on the screen. Okay. Right. So I am presuming you can see my screen at this time. Uh, if you notice the subject, the, the title of the subject, History of Sabbatarianism. And we want to, I just want to document how various in various times in the 2000 history of the church this particular you could say doctrine or belief or practice has been uh, followed by certain groups certain fellowships over the many years and it has almost become uh, institutionalized you know the whole concept of sabbath and when I say Sabbatarianism, I will try to explain that in just a moment. Uh, this some, is something that the church has uh, followed quite closely. But along with a brief history, and I must say that I could not find uh, too many resources to be able to document the history of it with among the various groups uh, as much as I would like to have. But I will try to make an attempt to just show you how many, uh, how many fellowships and groups have followed this particular practice. And today, there are also those who continue to follow the practice. But along with this, I want to also discuss uh, this particular scripture where Jesus um, talks about the Sabbath uh, that was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, we will have a very short study on that just to help us understand where do we place the Sabbath or how do we understand the very concept of the Sabbath. And I think uh, that is something which I feel uh, the church needs to know. So, okay. So having said that, um, 
let me ask this question. What is Sabbatarianism? And it is a little bit more, uh, I would say, uh, a little bit more broader than what we, we thought it was in the past. Uh, we would isolate it to just the seventh day Sabbath. But let me give you a definition as I have, uh, 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 you know, picked up, picked it up from one of my readings where it says Sabbatarianism is usually defined as the belief that Christians should observe a particular day of the week as the Sabbath, either the seventh day or the first day of the week. So the concept of Sabbatarianism is not restricted to just the seventh day, even though the seventh day adherence will very vehemently, you know, uh, mm. uh, oppose if you say that Sunday is also, or the first day of the week is also part of Sabbatarianism. Uh, the reason why such a definition is given is because Sunday Sabbath keepers, those who believe that the first day of the week is the Sabbath, are equally strict about keeping the Sabbath, just as the Seventh-day adherents. So, so the word Sabbatarianism has been uh, broadly given to those who isolate one day of the week to believe that that is the day that they must uh, come together for fellowship or worship or keep it as a rest day or dedicate it to God, however you might term it. Right? So, yes, we have Seventh-day Sabbath keepers that began, of course, from uh, even the times of Israel. Uh, but as the church progressed, there were those who very strictly observed the first day of the week as the Sabbath. Uh, one of the examples of those who kept the first day of the week very, very strictly, the Sunday observance, was the Puritans uh, who, who were part of you know, church history, and maybe we'll make a mention of them a little later. Now, Sabbatarianism is something that uh, uh, some people believe is a core doctrine of the church. And, uh, you know, and they have taken it on as something that must be enforced. Let me read you a quote, and I don't have the I'll just stop sharing for a moment so that I can see most of you. Uh, I'm just giving you a quote from uh, a Seventh Day Adventist scholar. His name is Samuel Bakioki, and he says the following: "The survival of both Judaism and Christianity as dynamic re religions may well depend on the survival of the observance of their respective Sabbaths." So in other words, here is one man who believes that this uh, command or this observance, this practice must be enforced by the church. And that is what will ensure the survival of the church. And that is how uh, he believes uh, it. So coming back to Sabbatarianism, remember I said that it has a broader connotation. Sabbath, Sabbatarianism is interpreted as a day, right? It is a 24-hour day which is kept aside, believed to be holy, and it has to be observed in the way they believe uh, the scriptures tell us as a rest day or a day of fellowship or worship. Uh, so in other words, it is a physical day limited to a particular uh, time, right? Uh, that is 24 hours from sunset to sun to sunset. And of course, the, uh, the Seventh-day Sabbatarians will believe that the Sabbath begins Friday sunset and Saturday sunset. The, uh, I presume the Sunday sa Sabbath keepers will believe that it starts sunrise <laughs> and maybe lasts until sunrise the next day. All right. What I want us to understand is Sabbatarianism does not take 
the symbolic meaning of the Sabbath as we have come to understand. They take it as a literal, they interpret it literally as a 24-hour day, all right? It's a literal interpretation. They don't see a metaphor in the Sabbath command. Or if you go back to the creation account, when God rested, they are not seeing a metaphor there, but they are seeing a, a physical rest, all right? Um, of course, uh, we have to ask the question, why would God rest, right? Did he get tired? Uh, was he uh, on a break? Uh, so, you know, there's a question that remains that needs to be answered. And I believe that when we look at the metaphor, we might be able to get the answer for that. All right. So what I, what, this is my interpretation. This is how I understand it, that when you look at it only literally, we lose the rich meaning for Christians. For us who are not Israel, who are not under the old covenant, uh, if we literally interpret the Sabbath, we begin to lose its rich meaning as we would want to understand from the scriptures. Um, Sabbatarians isolate one command. They isolate one command and give it great importance. I would say that they put it on a pedestal while no other command is given as much importance as the Sabbath, as much as I understand, maybe some people do believe or give importance to all others, but many fellowships don't, especially those who believe in a very strict literal interpretation. Uh, the Sabbatarians give so much importance to a literal interpretation that they even identify themselves with that one command. They do not necessarily want to identify with any other, but they will identify that with that one command, that is the Sabbath. They will even call their organizations after that command. For example, Seventh-day Adventists, right? Uh, though those are the largest adherents. They call themselves after a command, which I believe is uh, putting it on a pedestal, right? They don't call themselves, uh, we don't murder church of God. <laughs> they don't call themselves, we do, not idol we do not do idolatry church of God. But they will say seventh day church of God or Sabbatarian church of God, right? They, uh, they identify with that one command. And even to such an extent that they even, uh, you know, uh, name their organization after it. So they believe that true Christianity is identified by that one command. Uh, and all others are probably peripheral uh, as much as uh, I would understand. So, so that's the reason why I say Sabbatarianism is uh, much broader than, uh, you know, just isolating it to uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath, even uh, there are first-day Sabbath keepers. And like I explained, Sabbatarianism um, uh, have a very strong emphasis on a literal physical interpretation. And I'm presuming that many of them may not look at it from a metaphorical perspective, that it has a meaning beyond the physical that it has a spiritual connotation that Jesus Christ brings it. So that is uh, some, some explanation I wanted to give. But let's move to, oh, I, might, I need to get back to my screen. Give me just a moment. So, okay. Let's move to then this rabbinic thought. Uh, uh, the rabbis uh, also had certain perspectives on the Sabbath command. And they believe that the Sabbath was basically meant for Israel and for no other nation. And they quote Exodus chapter 16, which I will bring up on the screen at the moment, 
and I hope you can see that. Um, let me just see, it's, why is it not moving? Uh, okay, there you are, Exodus 16 and verse 29. Notice it says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, right? And they would like to interpret that as Israel nation. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So rabbinic interpretation is that the Sabbath was given only for Israel and for no other nation. Because they will quote Exodus 16 saying, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. And also they interpret this particular scripture by, by saying that on the sixth day, he only gave Israel bread for two days. He, they, he, God did not give bread for, for two days for any other nation. So in other words, this was a command specifically meant for a nation at a particular point in time, limited to a ge geographical location. So because bread was not given to any other nation for, for, you know, uh, uh, for two days, they believed that it was meant only for Israel. Let me quote to you one of the rabbinic, uh, you know, uh, writings, uh, and it goes like this. It says, it is, in, it is in virtue of this that the sages stated that if some of the heathen observed the Sabbath, then not only do they not receive any reward, but they are even considered to be transgressing. <laughs> that is how they believe, right? So some of the ra rabbis believe that the Sabbath is specifically for Israel and not for the heathen, that is any other nation other than Israel or the Jews. And if they keep the Sabbath, according to them, they are transgressing the command. All right. So that is, you know, a, a rabbinic thought, which I thought I'll just, just let you know. All right, let's move on then. Let's just get a little bit into the history. Earliest Christian Sabbath observers, and this must be familiar to you, that the Jewish Christians who became Christ followers were the first uh, Christian Sabbath observers, all right? Before them, there were only Jews who kept the Sabbath. But when some of the Jews started becoming Christians, they wanted to continue the observance of the Sabbath. And that's how Sabbath came into the church. And of course, as you know from history, that very soon conflict arose uh, the, uh, and uh, some of the Gentiles who became part of the church began to protest that they don't want Jewish observances, especially circumcision, and which also included the Sabbath. They said, and then of course, you know that first Jerusalem council, uh, uh, they had to discuss this and uh, the uh, the or rather the the conclusion was that gentiles were only told to do certain things which was prescribed in the jewish law but not others all right so this was the earliest observance among christians with regards to the sabbath we know if you read book of acts that paul customarily preached in the synagogues on the Sabbath. Um, if you read the book of Acts, you will see on the many occasions that he preached on the Sabbath. However, now what is important here is, uh, uh, is the following. Uh, the disciples did not meet just on the Sabbath. The disciples of Jesus, we are told on many occasions, sometimes met daily. And we have the powerful example of Acts chapter 2, where they came together daily to listen to the apostles preach, to break bread, and of course to fellowship. And sometimes, as is mentioned in Acts 19, Paul preached daily, not just on the Sabbath. So he went to the synagogues on the Sabbath because there was assembly there, but he also preached on a daily basis. There is no record that Paul taught his converts 
those he preached to, to keep the Sabbath as the way it was commanded in the commandment. And of course, we have the very famous uh, writing of Paul in to the Colossians in chapter 2, that a uh, Christian should not be judged uh, about special days. Uh, he spe specifically asked the Roman Christians to tolerate Differences in worship, in worship practices, having to do with foods and days. If that is Romans 14. If you read through that, you will also notice that Paul did not enforce Christians to keep the Sabbath. So none of the texts give any command for Christians to meet on or to avoid meeting on any particular day. Now, this is just some comments I'm making from observations we can make from the book of Acts and the early church. All right, now let's just move uh, uh, and ask the question, when did the Sunday thing come about? Now, remember, the Christians were observing or rather meeting on a daily basis. So they didn't necessarily seem to make a big deal about meeting only on a particular day. All right, but so, but when will then when did the Sunday thing come about? And just a, a few thoughts on that. Church in the second century. Now, this is after the first century church was established, and we can now uh, see that almost all second century Christians observe Sunday as a day of worship, uh, not a day of required rest. I mean, they did not observe it as a required rest, but a day of worship, right? Rather than the Sabbath, which was the seventh day. So the, this is even in the, as early as the second century, Christians moved the day of worship to the first day of the week. Uh, maybe they stopped the practice of meeting on a daily basis like the apostles did but they moved it to the first day. Uh, just to prove, uh, just to quote one of the church fathers, Justin Martyr, he gives the following evidence. And this is, uh, you know, common era 150, or, or, or I could say 150, 80. Notice he says, Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. So he documents that many Christians, most Christians started fellowshipping on Sunday or worshipping on Sunday. Their common assembly was on Sunday and they moved away from the Sabbath observance. All right. Now, why do I say this? Because there are some who would like to believe that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by Constantine in 300 AD. And this is uh, not factual. The Sunday observance started quite quickly, you know, uh, and sometimes maybe they met, like I said, daily, or maybe they met on Saturday and Sunday. But Sabbath, uh, the Sunday observance came fairly early and it, uh, it is not Constantine uh, who changed, like we, like some would like to believe, the Sabbath to Sunday. Now, of course, we know the Roman, uh, the, the 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 church did have some edicts about that, but that came later. All right. Um, so this is where uh, you know Sunday observance came in. But some groups continued to have a literal observance of the seventh day Sabbath. And let me just show you uh, some of the groups that continued uh, seventh day observance by taking it, uh, uh, by uh, giving it a literal interpretation. And here are some of the groups that I have found through the study I've made. The, I don't know, this is. Uh, I was thinking whether, whether this was a spelling error, but Sabatians and Syrians in Syria, <laughs> late 4th century, they were found to be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, all right? 
Then you have the Celtic Church under the leadership of Patrick, uh, Columba, and Dinuth in 597 Common Era or, or AD. So you have all these groups uh, beginning to keep the seventh day Sabbath. We had the Aksumite kingdom in Ethiopia throughout the Dark Ages. They kept the Sabbath. And I must say something about the Ethiopian Christians that uh, in the 14th century, uh, you know, a, a very strong Sabbatarian movement was founded by a monk. And even the king of that particular area observed the Sabbath and made an edict that the Sabbath, that the seventh day Sabbath must be observed. And they were, they were called the Sabbath, Saturday Sabbatarians. <laughs> That's the name given to them, right? And of course, they went on to say, some of the, these uh, Christians say that a great apostasy took place uh, in early Christianity, apparently when uh, the Sabbath was uh, sort of abandoned or not kept or not practiced in the way they, they would want to. All right. Okay, let's move on. And there is the Waldensians of Northern Italy, uh, the Wadoi. So France, 12th century AD, you know, these are groups that kept the Sabbath. Then we have the Qatari and the Petrobrusians of France, 11th century. Uh, just I'm just identifying some groups who were kept the Sabbath. Uh, here are some more. The Pasaginis of the northern of northern Italy, 12th and 13th century. The Picards of, in Bohemia, 12th century. The Lollards in England late 14th century to the 15th century, Norway and Denmark, 15th century, and the Judaizing movement in Novgorod, Russia, a result of teachings of Lithuanian Jews between 1470 to 1475. And if I can just add here, I didn't put it in the list here, but if I can just add, there's an Indian connection with regards to Sabbath keeping. You know, as late as the middle of the 17th century, Jews and Christians in India were living together harmoniously in Cochin. And there appear to have been some common areas of faith and practice. And one of it was probably Sabbath observance. And so we had some Christians who were identified closer to the Jews who kept the Sabbath here in India. So that is even as... Uh, uh, as uh, early as the 17th century. Okay. All right. So this is uh, some of the groups that I've identified. I'm sure there are many more. But let's come to today. What about today? Who are the Sabbath Sabbatarians of today? I was shocked <laughs> to notice that as per one of the, um, you know, uh, online uh, or rather the uh, a website that I found, it's called the Ten Commandments.org. They say that there are over 500 churches and fellowships that keep the seventh day Sabbath. And who is the biggest among them? The biggest among them is the Seventh day Adventist Church, uh, that is the largest modern day Seventh day denomination, Sabbatarian denomination, with, can you believe, 21 million members. 21 million members in probably, you know, hundreds of uh, countries as of this is as of December 31, 2018. Today, we also have the Seventh-day Baptist Church who keeps the Seventh-day observance, the Church of God Seventh-day. And, uh, and of course, many of you know that the Worldwide Church of God was also listed. And today, I, I was just looking whether the Worldwide Church of God is listed. Interestingly enough, there is no Worldwide Church of God listed. But there is at least 12 uh, groups. Uh, and the websites say they are Armstrongites. Or they are called British Israelites. And they keep the Sabbath. These are splinter groups from the Worldwide Church of God, and at least 12 of them were identified who are referred to as Armstrongites or British Israelites who have a very strict observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. Okay, that's as much as history. <laughs> uh, like I said, I was uh, not able to, uh, I mean, I, at least I don't have resources 
uh, as much as I would want it to. But nevertheless, this Sab Sabbatarianism has continued uh, right throughout the, the history of the church for 2000 years. Let me quickly now go to my second point I wanted to discuss, and that is Mark chapter 2, this, the scripture that I quoted. Uh, verses 27 and 28, as you see it on your screen, uh, this is uh, when Jesus said, said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Very, very popular and famous saying of Jesus. And I just wanted to bring this up for us to understand something about the Sabbath, which maybe we didn't fully see earlier. Maybe we did, maybe we did not. Some, some did believe in a, in, a, in a spiritual meaning of the Sabbath. But I think we see it more clearly today. And I just wanted to uh, bring that up uh, for us to consider. To understand what Jesus is trying to probably say here, we need to see the context in which Jesus said this. And uh, I will just read some parts uh, from, or rather some of the scriptures in Mark chapter 2 so that we can put it into context. Let me just go uh, to, the, to verse 5. And here I am once again reading. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, maybe I'll just stop sharing for the moment and just, just speak to you directly. You know, uh, uh, let's look at the context in what, where the scripture, uh, you know, is, it comes to be. If you remember, Jesus heals the paralyzed man in, this is all in this, in the same chapter. Jesus eats with sinners and then uh, he talks about the, you know, the, the, the new wine and the new wine skins. And then he talks about the Sabbath was made for man when the Pharisees started accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. Uh, let's just go back to that first part in Mark chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 5 where it says, when Jesus saw their faith, if you remember, the paralyzed man was dropped down from the roof. and uh, uh, and Jesus then, of course, is, uh, you know, uh, he acclaims their faith. And this is what is recorded by Mark. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> right. Uh, when he says your sins are forgiven, verse six, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus makes an interesting uh, response. In verse 8, I'm dropping down verse 8, it says, Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and take up your mat and walk. Verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority. Notice that. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And keep that thought in your mind, authority. Uh, because Jesus, uh, you know, we have to tie that up with that verse that we are trying to interpret. All right. And so Jesus goes. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up and take up your mat and go home. So he took up uh, his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So this is one thought you need to keep in mind in, in the context, the context in which Jesus said uh, the Sabbath was made for man. Okay, let's go to the second part where again, Jesus, in verse 16, says, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, 
why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right. Here is another aspect, another context we must consider with regards to the scripture that we are trying to understand. One more thought before we explain, uh, you know, the scripture that we are studying. Uh, here in the same chapter, I'm reading from verse 23 on one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples walked along. They began to pick up some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Verse 25, he answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then, verse 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh, I just want to, again, bring up the screen. I'll just share the screen with you. Uh, so this is the scripture that we are trying to understand. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Um, okay, let me just see. How, so again, this is one more. Oh, yeah, the context. Let's look at the context again. Notice he healed a paralyzed man. He said, your sins are forgiven. And of course, then he said, take up your mat and walk. In other words, he was healed of, of his paralysis. Then we read, Jesus eats with sinners and Jesus says sinners need to be saved, uh, healed. It is they who need a doctor, right? In other words, sinners need to be, you know, not ignored. And then he goes on to say Sabbath was made for man. In other words, man was to benefit from the Sabbath. And then, of course, he ends by saying Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus' authority, in other words, cannot be questioned. You remember the authority part uh, when he uh, mentioned about, uh, it was mentioned earlier, all right? So what do we learn from the context and then, of course, the utterance of Jesus? These are some thoughts that I have, I would like to share with you. One is that man is greater than the Sabbath. The needs of, the, of human beings are greater than the literal observance of the Sabbath. Notice, man needs forgiving. Humankind needs healing. Sinners need to be brought into uh, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord, right? So in other words, Jesus is saying the Sabbath was to serve man. Now here, once again, very clearly, there is something more to the Sabbath than just physical observance, just a rest. See, the Sabbath was to serve man. And I can see something much deeper that Jesus is trying to communicate. Now, let me just say that making the Sabbath bigger than man's need is the wrong use of the Sabbath command. If we take the Sabbath command and uh, make it bigger than the needs of human beings, then we are not, uh, we are missing something with regards to the Sabbath, Sabbath command. You see, the fact that Jesus was allowing his disciples to eat corn or saving an animal from the pit, both which Probably the Pharisees found, uh, you know, uh, as violation of the Sabbath, Jesus said, no, the needs of human beings are more important. What are man's needs? Certainly healing, like, uh, like we see in the context. 
sinners not to be ostracized, but to be saved. But let me now take it to the next level. What is humankind's greatest need? It is not just physical healing. It's not just filling your belly or giving you know, food to the hungry. The greatest need of human beings is saving, being saved from corruption, from suffering, from death. And this is where the Sabbath has a deeper spiritual meaning. You see, that is where the Sabbath for us Christians should be more than physical. It should be spiritual. It should be a metaphor. It was to depict a time of rest, or you could say a restful and harmonious relationship with God. And that is why God rested on the seventh day immediately after he created human beings. He wanted himself and human beings to live in a restful state, a harmonious rest in the sense where there is no suffering and misery and and all the ills that we see today, right? He, God's relationship with human beings was to be tranquil, peaceful, comfortable, undisturbed. That is the rest that God wants for human beings, not just a physical rest. And when Jesus says, Sabbath was made for man, he was basically trying to help us understand there is a greater Sabbath that is coming that will give man the real rest, not just physical rest, the real rest from misery, suffering, death, and all of that. And that is why Jesus then identifies himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus Christ was the ultimate picture of the Sabbath. He has become our rest. It is in him we have the perfect restful relationship with God. Hence, the Sabbath was made for man, for man's benefit and ultimate peaceful existence. All right. I'll stop sharing and then just uh, finish off with some more comments. And then we'll open it up for questions. Sorry, it's gone a little longer than I expected. <laughs> all right. You know, we're all looking for a rest. All of us want a rest. And all we have to see, look around us and see the misery and the suffering, the lack that we all struggle with. We, every one of us go through that. And the Sabbath is the most beautiful picture that God created to give us a picture of what rest must really be, right? Jeremiah spoke of that rest and he told, he prophesied to the nation of Israel of that rest that the Lord would bring. And let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses one and two, it says, at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. That is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword will find favor in the desert. And notice he says, I will come to give rest to Israel. I will come to give rest to Israel. Why does he talk about a rest when he already have the Sabbath? So what Jesus, what, what Jeremiah is talking about is the real rest that will come at a future date. Right? He is not talking about the seventh day Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath is only a pointer to the real rest that we have in Jesus Christ alone. He is the rest that we are looking forward to. And that is why we have a rest in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. When God rested, it was a pre precursor to the real rest that God wanted human beings to have with himself. All right. So let me end by uh, just reading to you uh, 
once again going back to the Sabbatarianism, where, where the Sabbatarians only look at the Sabbath command as a physical command, and in my opinion, miss the rich meaning of what the Sabbath is. I read from an article titled The Spiritual Touchstone of Sabbatarianism, written by Leaf. L. Leaf, uh, that's how it's, I am not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. The article is titled The Spiritual Touchstone of Sabbatarianism. It goes on to say, a touchstone is defined as test or criterion for determining the quality or genuineness of a thing. Adventists, like most Sabbatarians, will test all things by the Sabbath. The criterion for judging whether a church is genuine or if a Christian is faithful is decided by whether they keep the Sabbath. This is their spiritual plumb line, their prime theological reference point. And here is the point that he is trying to make. Placing the Sabbath at the center of Christian consciousness rather than the finished work of Jesus turns the gospel inside out. It places the law at the center of salvation rather than the cross. It does not focus on what God has done through Christ for salvation, but rather on the believer performing a weekly ritual in order to merit or prove themselves worthy of salvation. I thought I'd just mention that uh, because uh, I say that because once again, if we miss the real meaning of the Sabbath, and I think then we are poorer for it. Okay, that's the end of it. <laughs> we have 10 minutes. Uh, open it up for some thoughts, points of discussion. I'm sorry if I've uh, been a little controversial, maybe for some, <laughs> uh, but uh, I believe that uh, it's very important for us to understand. Anil, go ahead. Uh, I have three questions. First is a relatively minor one. Uh, why do they call themselves the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Advent is the coming. I mean, Jesus is not coming on Seventh Day. Right. One. Second, <clears throat> somewhere I think in Matthew, Jesus says, talking about the tribulation and so on, says, pray that your flight is not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. Yeah. So what was he referring to there? If the Sabbath was not being kept at that time or wasn't to be kept, why did he mention that? Okay. And the third, I think, is which was very critical is the law, the Sabbath keeping is, is part of the Ten Commandments, right? So none of the other ten uh, the nine commandments have been done away because now Jesus is our, our everything and so on. So why is it the Sabbath commandment has been done away? Okay. And why was it included in it in the first place if it was not to be permanent? <laughs> okay. These are my three questions. <laughs> All right. Wow. Loaded. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the first one. Uh, now, let me just remind me if I... Uh, no, Adventism, right? Adventism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Word Advent is obviously the coming of Jesus. And Seventh-day Adventism is born from the Millerite movement. This is in 18... 1840 or something, there was somebody called Joseph Miller who believed that Jesus was coming in his time and he gave dates. He gave the first date, they, everybody went to the mountain, but Jesus didn't come. Then oh. he advised <laughs> another date and then they again thought Jesus is coming. And from him came the Seventh-day Adventist movement because they believed that the Jesus would be coming. And I'm presuming they might probably think he's coming on a Sabbath. I'm not sure. About that, but uh, but that is where the Adventist word comes in. Okay. Second, your second question was, uh, uh, why did Jesus Matthew. say, yeah, yeah Matthew, uh, uh, you know, pray that your flight is not on Sabbath. Jesus was referring to what would happen in to the temple or to Jerusalem in seventy A.D. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. He was talking about not the end times as of now, but what was going to happen to Jerusalem that the Roman garrisons will come and sack the mm -hmm. city 
and destroy the temple. And he knew that there would be Jews still keeping the Sabbath. And so a reference was made to that. Of course, we don't have time to fully expound that, but that was the reference. It was not to any other uh, event. Okay. Third point. Uh, why is the Sabbath done away and not the others done away? I will take exception to the word done away. Nothing is done away. No commandment is done away. What is important for us to understand is Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't do away with the law. He fulfilled it. In other words, in him, the law is being fulfilled. In other words, our point of reference is Jesus Christ and not the law. Because Christ has taken it, you know, fulfilled it in himself. So you be, it is wrong to say it's done away. But it is fulfilled. Now, once again, we don't have the time to go and explain all of that. Uh, but like I just said, the Sabbath has rich meaning. It has a metaphorical meaning. And Jesus Christ is the point of reference. He is our rest. Right? So to that extent, we believe in the rest. And our rest is a person, not a day. Our rest is a person, not a day. I'll leave it there. If you, you know, once again, we can say a lot about that, but uh, 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 is that is that helpful, Anil? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> it is, but just coming back to that second question that you mentioned that he was, Jesus was mentioning about the <clears throat> destruction of Jerusalem in 70. Yeah. But so, so even then, why was he mentioning the Sabbath that, that your flight may not be in Sabbath? So, I mean, what was the significance of that? It was being observed or not to be observed? What? Well, once again, um, we don't have enough information there to understand exactly what Jesus meant. But I would like to believe that he would, I mean, uh, he, would, he would understand that there would be Sabbath keepers and... Uh, it would be more difficult for them if they are going to be, you know, keeping it, you know, so strictly for them to flee. Yeah. Right. So that is how I understand it. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, once again, uh, there could be something more to that. If anybody else has any thoughts on that, please feel free to share. Right. Uh, Surimurti, go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, are you unmuted? Uh, can you unmute yourself, Surimurti? Uh, yes. Um, Go ahead. First, first I tell you something in very lighter vein. <laughs> then I will tell you something more thoughtful. Okay. The Jews in Israel today, how do they observe the Sabbath? From Friday evening, or uh, what is the time? Uh, the Jews. Uh, uh, no, I am telling you the answer. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I thought you were asking me a question. In in Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv, the city is open throughout the night. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead. But in Jerusalem, all transport comes to a halt in the evening of Friday. So this is something in light living. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to mention about the Sabbath lift, which no, goes... <laughs> hmm? The Sabbath lift, which goes very slowly <laughs> because it's the Sabbath. <laughs> okay. Go ahead with, with your I other... experience that. Okay. <laughs> I am a retired man. 
I have 24, 24 hours at my disposal to rest. Yeah. While observing Sabbath, I had very difficult time in the bank. For some years, I could not observe the Sabbath in the bank. But for many more years, bank had somehow accommodated me in honor to enable me to keep the Sabbath. So with all these things at the background of my mind, what I now do, I feel Sabbath is the prime place in my life. It is God's commandment. Because God has given me the rest, I, I find no problem in keeping Sabbath. When I could not keep the Sabbath in the bank, I was working on the Sabbath sometimes. So, as you said, Sabbath is not greater than man's needs. Sabbath is not greater than man's needs. If I had just, yes, I have, I have resigned from the job three times. Still, God had kept me in the job. I was penniless several times, but God kept me kept me alive because of the Sabbath. Right. So what I feel is that you know I feel obliged to keep the Sabbath. I don't take it to extreme extreme conditions. Like okay. I will not do this. I will not do this on the Sabbath. If situations warrant. If the doctor say you come on Saturday, you go on Saturday. If there is something else you have to do on Saturday, you do it without any feeling of guilt. Yeah. So the, that is how I look at the Sabbath. And one more thing, God, God, God still loves the Sabbath. I don't remember the particular verse where he says, you call it a delightful day. I will, I will bless you or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and in the future also, in the kingdom of God, God says, Sabbath is going to be kept. The Sabbath is going to be kept. In what way, we do not know. But this is how I view it now. For, for the present, for my life. I am not, not advocating for any person. In the situation where I am, I feel this is the right thing. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you, Suramuti. We couldn't hear the last part of what you said, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm glad that uh, you have a uh, a, spe a specific bonding with the physical keeping of the Sabbath, and that's fine. Uh, and I pray that uh, you will continue to enjoy and find it a delight to do that. Uh, many of us find our delight in Christ our Lord. So, uh, so you know, uh, and that's wonderful too. So, Bertie, Bertie, you had a thought. Go ahead. No, last, what I said in the last was. Yeah, yeah. I am. I am looking at the Sabbath from my point of view for what I have to do for yeah. my life. I am not advocating it for anybody else or for any other group or for any other denomination. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for mentioning. That's, that's a very important thing. Uh, we, otherwise, you know, we try to start uh, judging others. We shouldn't do that. Yeah. Bertie, go ahead. You had a thought. Yes. Uh... Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, you just mentioned that delight is in Jesus Christ. Our faith is centered in Christ Jesus. And uh, we uh, celebrate his, the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ on a Sunday. And, uh, you know, we delight, we're happy for that and all. Uh, I would suggest, uh, why don't we uh, make it special? <laughs> make, uh, you know, make, make the Sunday celebration. Every yeah. Sunday, just like, uh, you know, it was uh, just like uh, the Sabbath was intended to be a blessing to the people of the old covenant. It applied to Israel and, uh, and Christ has fulfilled the law and now he brings us into himself. We rejoice in the hope of uh, in, uh, eternal life in Christ and we meet on Christ. We celebrate, you know, we worship every Sunday. Uh, I would suggest, uh, yeah. I hope uh, Mr. Mr. Nagar and Surya Muthi and all the others are hearing, try to make it special. Yes, <laughs> yes Bharti, thank you. Yes, I think uh, <laughs> that's a good suggestion. Maybe a special meal. Uh, you know, if you, what I'm saying, uh, my last point, if we have that in mind, uh, we know Christ is everything to us. We know he's the Lord of the Sabbath. It would, uh, it would enrich us if we, uh, you know, uh, delighted, you know, showed our delight for the Lord uh, in our worship and in our rest with the family. Uh, uh, the point is, make Sunday, <laughs> you know, a time, you know, set aside, you know, to make it special. So, yeah. uh, okay. Maybe we benefit from it. Okay. Well said, Bertie. And uh, all of you, <laughs> make, make a celebration out of it. Uh, of course, we are, you know, always celebrating Christ. Franklin, go ahead. Um, we are taking just a, just a little extra time. I hope you're okay. But don't leave him out. <laughs> yeah. Don't leave Murthy out. Let him, you know, have a double delight. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Franklin, yeah, you sir, like sir, can you hear? Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Sir, I have two questions for you. One simple question and uh, a little tougher question. Sir, you quoted a uh, second century theologian, Mr. Justice, Justin. Yes. In, the, in that particular quote, sir, uh, theologian Justin makes a statement, Christ rose on a Sunday. Uh, yes. is, this is this technically correct? Because, sir, as we understand today, there are three different interpretations for crucifixion and resurrection. Right. How could Justin categorically say Christ rose on a Sunday? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, can sir. I answer that? Uh, yes, sir. Is it technically correct? Okay. All I can say is this. We can, we can keep fighting about when he rose. Was it uh, the split second before the Sabbath ended or a split second after the Sabbath ended? Right? We can keep fighting and we will never come to a conclusion. My, my answer to you is this. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Yes or no? 100% yes, sir. Yes, that is all we need. Uh, <laughs> if, he rode at, if he rose at 6.59 or 7.51, <laughs> I don't care. I, I, all I believe is Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's enough for me. Okay. okay. Can, we, can we go to a little bigger question, sir? Okay. Yes, sir, uh, may I, sir, may I quote a verse from the book of Hebrews? And I would like you to respond to this. Sir, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Okay. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 10, for okay. everyone who enters God's rest also enters rests from their works, just as God did from his. Okay. And then verse 11 concludes, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So okay. may, may, can you please respond to this? Sir? Yes. Uh, uh, Franklin, we don't have the time to do that. That since you mentioned it, I will take it up as a study, a, a special study, and we will study that at another time. Is that okay with you? Perfectly okay, sir. Sir, yeah. Hebrews chapter verse 4, 9. Yeah, Hebrews 4 is a big one on the Sabbath. We have, uh, you know, taken it back and forth. We will come back on that. Okay, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Zakaria, I just want to say a word. Okay, sir. Uh, Thank you so much. Can I say? I... Go ahead, Bertie. Bertie, go ahead. In the book of Isaiah, it's mentioned... Uh, uh, in returning and rest uh, shall you be saved in quietness and trust or confidence uh, uh, will be your strength but you would not 
uh, hence the Lord will wait and so on it goes. Hence the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you and so shall he be exalted and that he may uh, have mercy on you for the, for the Lord is the God of judgment. Uh, blessed are all they that wait for him. Uh, uh, you know, Mr. Zachariah, we're taking up that uh, study on that. Just try to, uh, try to remember this, what I just mentioned. Uh, okay. In return and rest uh, shall you be saved and in quietness and trust uh, shall be your strength and so on. What is just what is the verse you mentioned? The chapter was. I don't know. Some I think somewhere after the forties, after after the forty okay. chapter, forty six, okay. somewhere after I think 44, 46, somewhere. It's I'll check it out. If you yeah, if you just, come across it, can you just WhatsApp the reference to me and I'll have a look at. It. You just in Google, you just put that in okay. returning rest. Yeah, in returning rest. Where is it? Oh. And it'll show you the. Okay. It'll tell that, us. Yeah. We'll we'll look just, into that. Lord. Yeah. To aid you in your study of that. Okay. All right. Uh, I think Praveen has just written a some thoughts. Uh, I'll just read it. Uh, he says the Maccabees movement suffered wars during Sabbath, where Jews could neither fight nor defend, so they were massacred. He probably he probably connecting the suffering to the suffering they went through. I think this is in response to Anil your question about fleeing on the Sabbath. So he says, uh, so that the Jews could relate to the great pain that would come. Uh, I hope I'm right, uh, Praveen, uh, with uh, the reference you're making. So uh, that is the uh, answer to the Anil's question. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, well, uh, sorry that we went a little over time, but I just hope that uh, uh, we had some good thoughts. So uh, I, will, I will take up Hebrews 4 since uh, that is connected with Sabbath keeping. So we'll come back to that. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, may I request our elder Franklin to please close in prayer. We can't hear you, Franklin. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sir, can, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear yeah. you now. Go ahead. Okay, yes. A gracious Lord, a loving father. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time and privilege and opportunity to look at a subject that has been raging over decades or centuries. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the intellectual honesty and the courage to look at, a partic to look at particular verses and take a fresh look at it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors, Dan, Sachin, Praveen, who work hard, and who shared their findings. Thank you, Lord, for all of us, Lord, who have, who have gathered on this, on this special platform to learn and to grow in a world that is demanding our time elsewhere. Thank you so much. Lord, we pray that you will fill our hearts with your love and help us, Lord, to grow into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you. Ultimately, Lord, the test of true Christianity is Love your neighbor as thyself. Lord, may your love flow into us and out to others, Father, so that we are able to grow day by day in your grace and knowledge. Lord, be with all of us and bless those who could not attend today's. Lord, it is, my, it is our desire that they will uh, switch on to the video and they will listen and learn and come up if they have any questions or need clarifications. Bless them also, Lord. Thank you so much, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you all. Have a good rest of the day. We'll catch up later. <laughs>